Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book, The Cost of Discipleship. This is the book that I have in my library. It's underlined. It has uh, folded pages. I know that some people will be shocked about that, but it's a great book. And I would recommend that anybody uh, who is serious about learning what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ should probably pick up a copy themselves and uh, read through it. I've read through it a couple of times. One was about 20 years ago. Um, and then just recently, about a year ago, and I found it to be so encouraging, but also at the same time, quite challenging. Uh, as I said, this was a book written by the German pastor, uh, also an opponent of Adolf Hitler, Bonhoeffer, and he wrote it back in 1937, just before the start of World War II. Now, in this book, Bonhoeffer challenged people to count the cost and then to make the decision to live as true disciples of Jesus. Any true disciple hearing his challenge, and for that matter, reading the book, would most certainly agree with Bonhoeffer. However, when Bonhoeffer himself counted the cost and then lived as a true disciple of Christ, that decision literally cost him his life. Now, the question is this for you and I. Would we be willing to pay the cost of discipleship today? I'm talking about in our own personal lives, in our homes, in our churches, in the world, at our jobs at the grocery stores, wherever we spend our time and, and uh, spend our lives, if we knew that it would literally cost us our lives? You know, I think we sometimes can say an easy yes to that question because it sounds like a exciting plot in an epic movie. But I think we forget that even in the movies, there's struggles and losses. For example, in The Lord of the Rings, the fellowship eagerly left, uh, leaves Rivendell, little knowing of the true cost of their task, but believing in all the glories that be sure to follow. And there were glories, for sure, but they had to go through the valley of death first. Now, for some, that was figurative, but for others, it was literal. With discipleship, there is a promise of something great and glorious, and for that matter, everlasting in the end. But there is also a cost up front. And and, and I think it's a good question to ask ourselves, what is that cost? If you're going to buy something, if you're going to purchase something, you should always be asking, what's the cost? Well, let me just say right up front that it's a, it's a big cost. And we're going to be exploring that this evening. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of tonight's message, let me point out that the title of the message this evening is, what's the cost? But another title may very well be, is Jesus worth it? Well, Consider that the call of Jesus isn't just a call uh, to suffering and, and to self-denial. It, it's, it's a call to a life of significance. Who wouldn't want to be uh, living a life of significance? It, it, it's a call. It's, it's the hope of a glorious resurrection, you see, where all the losses of life are going to be repaid. It's a, it's a promise that he'll help us endure the hardships that we'll definitely face along with a guarantee that the Father will give us the Holy Spirit to live this life of, of growing discipleship. It's also an assurance that though we lost our way in the Garden of Eden, that God has come to restore us to what we've been created for. We, you see, we were created for significance. Why? To bring glo glory to God. Knowing even a little, though, of who Jesus is and what he's done, is doing, and will continue to do, I think tells us that when we sit down to calculate the cost of following him, when we weigh the worst and the best of what it means to follow Jesus, we can't help but see that he is worth it. And you know what, church? He's abundantly worth it. Okay, so why don't we open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 14, and I'm going to read verses 25 uh, down to uh, verse 33. Now, great crowds accompanied. And he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks 
for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, those are pretty heavy words. But what we see in this passage is that Jesus calls out to those who would be his disciples. That's who he's speaking to. And what he does is he compels them. He, uh, he urges them to make a choice. And what that choice is, 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 is it, it can, be, can be asked in a question. Who's going to be first in their lives? So or who's going to be their priority? And I think we should be asking ourselves whether we hear the voice of Jesus calling out to us. And, and if you do, how are you going to respond? Are you going to be willing to count the cost? And more importantly, I think, is are you going to be willing to pay the cost? Will you be willing to pay the cost, cost in order to grasp the reality that you were created for significance in the kingdom of God? Now, if you're among those who say yes, and I hope you do say yes, then I want to encourage you to hear what Jesus has to say in this passage that I just read. Now, the first thing to notice in here is that Jesus doesn't just turn to his followers and, and lightly suggest that they might uh, sort of, kind of, begin thinking about serving him. You know, just come along and kind of check things out. He doesn't drop hints, hoping his group is going to catch on. He doesn't make any suggestions here. What he does is he makes clear demands, and he tells his followers to give it up, to pay up everything that they have, to pay the cost if they want to be his disciples. So I think uh, this begs a question, just what is the cost? Okay, so at this point in his ministry, great crowds are, are traveling along with Jesus, and they're, they're following him wherever he goes. I mean, there's just something exciting and magnetic about this Jesus of Nazareth. The, the authority with which he taught and the power of God seemingly at his beck and call drew multitudes of people to him. Of course, they hear about him. They want to find out about him. Uh, well, of course, not everybody traveling with Jesus is there for the same reason. There's a multitude of reasons, maybe as many reasons as there were people. Some were hoping for healing. Their brother got healed or their, their friend's neighbor got healed and, and they need some healing. So maybe they're there hoping for that. Some I could imagine would have been political activists looking for a liberator. They heard that the Messiah possibly is here and he's going to drive the Romans out. So let's go find out what he's all about. I think there would have probably been a number of people just curious as people tend to be with when some new movement arises. But some, I think, considered themselves Jesus's followers, his disciples. Now, I'm not speaking here about the 12 disciples that Jesus had chosen. You know, the, the 12 that we often see on uh, Leonardo da Vinci's painting, you know, I, I could never understand, by the way, why, why uh, they would ever be sitting together facing outwards. They, they obviously were in a meal. Reality would have had them sitting around in, in a circle in, in, in a room. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. I'm not talking about that group. I'm speaking about a much larger group outside of the 12. Uh, there would have been the, uh, the fringe group. Uh, in fact, there's a mention of 70 as well. So uh, it would have been that larger group and maybe even uh, uh, the larger group from that that would have been following even them. Now, exactly what they believed about Jesus isn't clear. Jesus was different than the average rabbi for sure. Okay, like when he says to them that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I mean, he wasn't about these endless lists of rules or measurements like the other rabbis that would uh, create all kinds of lists that you had to follow if you're going to be uh, following them and it, it became quite burdensome but Jesus was more about relationship okay so that was odd and so he, he drew a lot of curiosity from these people so they had to kind of check them out his yoke was offered in such a way that those who could never hope to make it, even based on ability or talent, can now make the team. You see, you had to measure up to these religious folks. So they never generally would invite fishermen and laborers and farmers and common housewives. And, and uh, uh, for that matter, they wouldn't invite, certainly wouldn't have invited um, tax collectors and, and uh um, prostitutes to join this team, but Jesus was a little different. And so maybe they saw this as not, you know, not only making the team, but now I could in this religious world become a starter. And so considering, considering this, they may have felt 
this was maybe into the elite club of their day. I don't know. Maybe they committed themselves to being students and followers of Jesus. Maybe they even considered themselves disciples. Maybe others in the great crowds that followed Jesus on this day were thinking about becoming his disciples. Either, either way, uh, Jesus wasted no time. He knew it was necessary to make the crowd aware of the commitment required to walk successfully as his disciples. So you see, Jesus sought recruits, not spectators. Yeah, we I think we have to understand that discipleship isn't an easy task. Jesus knows that. It's not without cost. And Jesus knew that. In our day, it, it seems, though, to many, the greatest sin one can commit is the sin of offending. And so we don't want to bring up this idea of cost. It's, it's, it's a little easier, people. We, we feel, in our culture anyways, that we want to be saying those kinds of things. So what do we do? We guard our words and our actions and our attitudes in case others become offended and turn away. We're tempted to make our requirements even for membership as simple and painless as possible. But Jesus wasn't concerned in the very least about being politically correct. We can imagine that Jesus' words to the crowds would have astonished and offended them. His words were a blatant frontal attack uh, uh, on the things, the very things that they treasured. Verse 26, as I had read, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate, think of that word, hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. I mean, Jesus brings all the family unit into it. And then he points to them and says, and yeah, even your own life, you can't be my disciple. So what's he talking about? But here Jesus refuses to spare the feelings of anyone who would claim to be a follower of his. The call of discipleship is fundamentally a call to allegiance. And Jesus refuses to be an afterthought. He refuses to be a diversion. He refuses to be a hobby in the lives of those who claim to be his disciples. So think about this. In the, in the middle of that crowd, a crowd that which lived in a society that valued family ties and commitments above all, here Jesus is proclaiming that a price, this heavy, heavy price is to be paid by those who are going to follow him. Now, realize right up front that Jesus wasn't calling his disciples to despise their loved ones. The word hate used in this instance is used rhetorically or comparatively. Jesus spoke of the priority of the disciples' commitment to him, a, a commitment that was to far outstrip all other commitments. You see, Jesus wasn't talking about feelings of animosity. You know those feelings where you look at your brother or your sister as you're growing up and you say, I hate you, and you just want to kick them or hit them. That's not what Jesus is talking about, hate. He was, he's not talking about these feelings of animosity. What he's speaking about is priority. Jesus was addressing in his day a culture in which the family was the absolute arbiter of all social interaction. In fact, the family was the center of the economy. They were the means for access to land and ownership. They were the mediator of synagogue membership, even the matchmaker of marriage partnerships. I mean, in that culture, family influenced everything. So it's in that light that we're to hear Jesus's words and feel the sting that would have accompanied them. If anybody comes to me and does not hate, then he goes on to say, can't be my disciple. So the price for it, that kind of commitment, that's costly. And for anyone in the crowd to make that ultimate commitment, they would actually risk alienation from their family, from their community, the, the social community, even the religious community. In fact, many disciples ended up paying for such a decision with their own lives. You know, discipleship is not an occasional volunteer work on, on your own terms and your own convenience. We got to understand, church, that there are costs that need to be made. And the cost in the end actually truly does mean our very lives. Sometimes it could be physical, but certainly spiritual. Everything we thought holding a number one priority in our lives, our, our family, our jobs, our political allegiances, our careers, our preferences, our possessions, even our own lives are to be offered up as a sacrifice to him. In other words, the cost is everything. And so Jesus invites us to not only count the cost, but he also says we got to pay the cost. By the way, what uh, Jesus is talking about when he says hating your brothers and sisters and your moms and dads and those 
and, and, and even your own life is no excuse to treat family members shabbily or with disrespect. Our, our responsibilities for a family still remain. That's biblical. Paul once wrote in, in 1 Timothy 3, if anyone doesn't provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, by the way, I think he might even be referring to moms there, take care of mom. What he goes on to say is he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's pretty heavy. What paying the cost does mean, however, is that following Jesus is to take first priority, even if it's painful, certainly if it's difficult, and even if it's misunderstood by anybody else around you in your culture and in your family. So Jesus says to the crowds traveling with him, unless you place me as the first priority, that's the number one priority over every other priority in your life, you can't be my disciple. And, and Remember this, his words speak to you and me also. He wrote to those people, but those words travel across time. They transcend time and space and they come to us as well. And so they're speaking to you and me. We can't avoid or weasel out of their impact and their force. That helps, I think, when we begin to understand that, I think it brings clarity to some of those adjustments that are required in areas that we may not have been willing to adjust or change or where we may have been even struggling with. I mean, once you know what your first priority really is, I mean, really is in your heart and you own that priority, it becomes yours, it becomes part of your DNA and your thinking in your life. You know, when you own that priority, then, then what happens that is that all other priorities and the, adjust, uh, the, the resulting adjustments just kind of seem to fall in line. So here's what I mean by that. If football is a priority for you, then you will plan your life around watching the game. If work is a priority for you, then you plan your life around work. If pleasures of life are a priority uh, to you, then you plan your life around those pleasures. Now, does it mean that you can't enjoy pleasures or, or work or, or watch football? Well, of course not. But rather, the question comes back to the same one every time. I think it you've got to keep asking, what is your first priority? Now, I'm going to throw this out there, and I know this might shock most of you, if not all of you, but some of you, and I would even suggest most of you are involved in affairs. What do I mean by that? Okay, it might be a physical affair, I hope not, between you and somebody else, or it might be an emotional affair, again, I hope not. Uh, but here's the thing, it may not even be an affair with a person. It might be an affair with other things in your life. And I'm saying this because I don't know if we've ever really thought about it this way. You see, anything that takes your heart away from your first priority of being a true disciple of Christ is an affair of the heart. Because it's taking you away from your first love, from your true love. So the choice is simple. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then that affair, whatever it might be, whoever it might be with, must end. Some of you might be holding grudges against someone else. The choice is simple. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you must do what you can to restore the relationship. Remember, church, as disciples, what do we do? We, we commit to repent often, forgive freely, and ex extend grace continuously. Some of you may be addicted to pornography or money or, or TV or shopping or, or uh, uh, camping or whatever it is. You may be addicted to something. Anything else that takes your mind away from being Christ is an addiction in an affair the answer is simple then if that's the case renew your first priority commitment to jesus i, I want to share this statistic to you this is one that just kind of blows my mind every time i hear it the average family has the television on for over seven and a half hours a day that's unbelievable now i don't know about you that that means by the way that there are some who don't have it on hardly at all if at all but that means then that to average out to seven and a half hours a day there are those who have it on for 14 to 20 hours a day so now I don't know about you personally, so I'm not pointing fingers here, but statistically, most people who identify as Christians don't spend more than 10 minutes a day in God's word. Average of seven and a half hours a day, television is on, average Christian, 10 minutes a day in God's word. And then we wonder why we're weak. I, I, in Psalm 1-3, we read that uh, a blessed man is like a tree who's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither. And all that he does, he prospers. It's a great 
uh, psalm, by the way, that my parents had us memorize when I was, when I was a child. And it speaks to so much truth about how we grow and how we get grounded. In fact, this particular verse, verse three of Psalm 1, uh, speaks about being grounded by thirst quenching water, nutrient enriched soil. I don't know if you've ever seen a satellite picture of the Nile River in Egypt. And if you ever have, you'd appreciate that picture. The land is rich and lush and it's so green with life. You can just see it uh, along the banks of the flowing river. You can see it from space, it's so bright. But as you move away from that river and from that water, life becomes scarcer and scarcer until soon, all that's left is sand, is, is desert, no life. The picture we have here is of a continual flowing in, in Psalm 1 of refreshing water that give the tree life. The, the water is flowing 24 seven and the tree is able to suck up all it requires to live. And not only to live, but to produce fruit and to be so lush and green and, and, and so life-giving. You know what burdens my heart? Is that I know people who will leave after their 60 minute fix of God's word on a Sunday. And they'll be so excited about living for Jesus, but by that very same evening are going to be continuing to struggle with the things that they were so sure were conquered after getting excited at church during the Sunday worship. I'm going to do it this time, pastor. I know it. I'm, I'm changed. I'm reborn. And they want to change. They so badly want to change, but they don't. They want to get close to Jesus, but they aren't. Why is that? Well, you can't be watered 40 to 60 minutes each week and expect to be strengthened. There has to be a continual watering, church. I mean, a, tr a tree will die without being watered. That is why we need to get involved ourselves in, in reading God's word daily, not just occasionally. We've got to follow Jesus daily, not just weekly. We've got to get involved with life groups. We've got to get involved in triads and in discipleship relationships, uh, gathering together for, for our Sunday gathering worship times whether we're doing responsive readings or, or even able to hear somebody lead us in a song. We gotta be in places where we can be helped and where we can be held accountable, where we can see others and others can see us. As the church, we're meant to be a community to build each other up in our faith. And here's the point, continually, not just once a week, not just once a month, and not just, continue, uh, not just occasionally. Listen, church, don't expect to grow and feel close to Jesus if you're not putting yourself in a position to be learning from his teachings, which we get from reading his word, from, uh, which we get while we're praying and learning how to pray. Don't expect to grow if we keep isolating ourselves from others who can speak into our lives. You see, discipleship isn't just a Sunday thing. It's a lifestyle. In Acts 2, we see that the early church meant daily. They, they became grounded in Jesus Christ. And, and when persecution came and the church grew and didn't fall apart, they, 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 they continued to, buy, uh, to be bound together. They were strong and healthy. And they produced fruit, just like the blessed man we saw in Psalm 1. So a question might come up. If we do all those things, then does that mean that we'll always succeed or that we'll never fail? Is that what you're telling us, Pastor? Well, let me tell you this right now, right up front. We will absolutely fall again. We still live in a life of sin and we're still growing and we're, and we're changing. But, but I think part of the reason is that most of us have such spiritually short attention spans. I mean, we live life for the moment. One moment we follow Jesus so closely and the next moment something else has you know, gotten our attention. I find that happens to me so often. We have our nose as close to Jesus one moment and then out of the corner of our eye, we notice something that grabs our attention and our priority, you know, follow Jesus, follow Jesus, oh, shiny, oh, follow Jesus, follow Jesus, squirrel. I, that, that just seems to be so much of our pattern of life. So much white noise going on all around us in our lives. Our, our attention and focus can be taken up by something else so suddenly we forget all about following Jesus and, you know, the next thing you know, He's over the next hill and he's out of sight from our lives. And then we wonder what happened, if we even wonder at all. That's why Jesus tells us in Luke 9.23 to take up our cross daily. He knew it would be something that we have to come back to again, again, and again. 
Paul tells us in Romans that we must present our bodies as living sacrifices so that we can be transformed by the renewal of our mind. He, he's talking about the sanctification of our lives. Sanctification, by the way, is the process of being made holy. Paul said it this way in Philippians 1.6. It's another one of my favorite verses where he says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Here, Paul's speaking of that promise of the sanctification in our lives. It's a picture of God preserving us and he's molding us and he's changing us and he's transforming us and he's working us because of his grace, not because we're so good. What we need to do is to keep so close to Jesus that everyone who sees you can't help but tell that you're one of his disciples. But the question comes back to, will you pay the cost? Well, we do need to make a choice. So many see Jesus as, you know, this guy with the perfect white teeth. I mean, he's not going to cause us to make such a deep, hard choice in life. He, you know, he's, he, he's so nice. He's got such luxuriant hair. and he's, he's got these bright blue eyes and that he seemed to be smiling. Eyes. And he's, you know, we, we, so many people in our culture anyways, they, they view Jesus as some kind of ancient hippie and self-help guru. He's just another founder of a religion like, you know, Muhammad, Abraham, and Buddha. He's the guy who taught eternal principles that are great, like the golden rule, and he showed us how to be a better people by his example. This Jesus, I mean, come on, he's kind, he's gentle, he's fun, and he's safe. For that matter, people even like Madonna, Justin Timberlake, they, I, I, I've seen them, you've probably seen them too, wearing t-shirts calling Jesus their homeboy. Yeah, go Jesus. Oprah Winfrey finds him inspirational. Brad Pitt respects him. I mean, what could be more, more watered down, easy to digest and safe for the whole family than that, right? Even political correctness. I mean, this, it pushes the belief that nobody's going to be lost, but all go to heaven, well, except maybe somebody like him. Hitler, he's going to go to hell, but hardly anybody else. And you know what? But that's not Jesus. Jesus gives the opposite message than what the world is trying to tell us. And for that matter, what the world is trying to tell us that Jesus is telling us. He's not the man who the world portrays. In Luke chapter uh, 13, verses 23 to 24, it said, uh, Jesus answered somebody a question. Somebody said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You know, think about this. The crowd of Christians is huge. In fact, it's numbering over a billion. Uh, that, that is, if you count all those classified by statisticians as Christians. But how many of those Christians are actually disciples of Jesus? I mean, how many have made a deliberate commitment to follow him? Well, when we look at Luke chapter 14, we see a lot of followers of Jesus. But I venture to say, there are few disciples. How many of us, I wonder, are simply followers of Jesus and not disciples? I, I, that can be a troubling question. It, it might even disturb our theologies and our comfort zones. But you see, our goal is not to be understood, but to understand the truth. Well, you know, Jesus looks at the large crowd traveling with him today and, and, and he says, hey, you're created for significance, but before that can be realized, your allegiance to me needs to be complete. Every other allegiance needs to pale before. You are created for significance, but you need to constantly be ready to die for me, if necessary, as you follow me. Yeah, you've been created for significance, but you know what? You got to count the cost before you start to determine if you're committed enough to follow me. And if you realize you aren't, then maybe you shouldn't even begin. You were created for significance, but you must give up everything you have to follow me to realize that. You know, I wonder what the crowd said. It would have been interesting to be a fly in the wall or a fly in the camel, I guess, in that, in that case. But I wonder what the crowd said, like what they even did. Did they gradually begin to thin out as his words struck home? Or did his words challenge them to move from their shallow following to now a determined committed follow. I think the more important question is, what are you going to say? What am I going to do? How many here listening to this message are followers? How many that gather at LifeBridge on Sunday evening are disciples? How many are willing to pay the cost? How many will embrace the truth that we were created for significance, but that there's a cost to see that become a reality? You know, our choice to follow Jesus is not based on talent. It's not based on ability. It's not based on how good you are. 
Bradley, you know what? It's based on commitment. The question isn't whether you are giving. It's whether he is giving. And in Jesus, we not only find someone who is good enough, but is also perfect. In fact, church, he's perfectly good.